Jason, thanks so much for joining us for this episode of the Advisory Board Podcast. Uh, guys, I'm here with Jason McReynolds, and let me tell you a little bit about him. We're going to be talking today about, about um, how, you gotta, how to build the right culture in a franchise system to find and retain and, and nurture the right kind of franchise owners in your system. It's an interesting topic, uh, but the reason that you should care about what Jason has to say is he's been in the industry for 25 years. Um, he's the CEO and founder of a company called Fran Metrics. And Friend Metrics, they do all sorts of analytics on franchise operations, field evaluations, all sorts of different things. I'll, let, I'll pitch it to you, Jason. I'd love for you to tell us a little bit more about yourself and why, why sure. you've got some really good background into this particular topic today. Oh, sure. Yeah. So, um, yeah, like you said, I've been in the fran fan franchise industry for about 25 years. I've been an entrepreneur for longer than that. I opened my first business actually when I was 15. Um, as a DJ company, uh, but I did franchise a company, joined the IFA, uh, so I've been in with the IFA for quite a while, um, but, you know, as my years of working with franchise or um, I, I've noticed and helped figure out how, how we can build relationships with the franchisee, I realized that was one of the biggest issues, um, you know, by watching, actually by watching it being done wrong, I learned how to do it right, yeah. and, um, and then as friend metrics, I advise and have actually helped set up um, several dozen franchisors from scratch. So I help build those foundations because, you know, typically I look at things, you know, you can approach franchising in, in two basic ways, through relationships and through culture and through the core values, or you can look at it as Basically, you sign this franchise agreement and I'm going to go bang that franchise agreement over your head every time you do something wrong, typically in a, you know, an adverse relationship. And so, you know, that's kind of kind of where I, you know, kind of guide and where my thought process has come to that based on my experience and my talking to other franchisors who do it right. I mean, mm -hmm. that's, yeah. That's great. Well, we're going to dive into that pretty deep today. Sure. I'm really mm -hmm. glad you were able to make time to join us and share some insights. When we, you and I were talking before, uh, I just I was taking mental notes about some of the things you said, because whether or not you're in franchising, I think this is relevant to any sort of organization structure, any sort of association, any sort of group that you're involved in. It's a very similar type of relationship. So, uh, so if, if you're not in franchising, I'd still recommend listening on because you'll get some deep sure. insights from Jason. Let, let's yeah. talk just a little bit about, about um, who defines the culture in a franchise system. This is a, an interesting insight, but I 100% agree with where you went with it yeah. before. Well, how, would you just, how would you define that? Like who, who's really building the culture of a franchise system? Well, you typically encourage culture, but whoever defines it is going to be the people who interact with your company. So your business has a culture, even if you don't write it down or think about it. It is what it is. If you're sitting there running one single little business and and you come to work upset and then your employees are upset and then there's this horrible kind of vibe people don't want to show up to work, that's your culture, regardless if you write it down uh, or whatever. So your employees, the people you interact with, your customers, what they say about you, that is your culture. Your culture is basically how you interact and, and, and act as an organization. So you want a certain culture. You have a you, you want your culture to be a certain way, but you can't, it doesn't mean it will be. You got to work on it. You got to build that up. And it, I think it's really important in a franchise organization because you're built, you're working with people who own their own businesses with the franchisees. And if you don't build that culture with them, uh, how are your customers? How are the people that work with your company? How are your vendors going to feel like you're one company. They're not, you're going to feel like 20 different companies with 20 different cultures, because yeah. if you don't define it, your franchisees are going to, or you're, if you don't um, guide it, your franchisees are going to have a different culture than, than yeah. you do as a franchise or yeah. it's going to be a mess. It's going to be a mess. Yeah. And I've got I'll, a funny story just came to my mind as you were talking about that. And the thing that I love about what you said when we were talking about it before is is the Z's, the franchisees and their employees are actually who defines the culture of the franchise system. And right. food service came to mind. And I remembered you know, I worked for, I worked with a bunch of guys and we'd go to Quiznos quite a bit. And I don't mean to bag on Quiznos, right? But, uh, <laughs> yeah. but it, it was, this story makes it a little easy. 
Uh, I their subs were way better than Subways, man. I loved them. They were so good. Agreed. Uh, their sauces, their meats, their cheeses, everything was way better. But we, there's this one, the closest of uh, Quiznos to us, there was a guy who like he wouldn't let us put tomatoes on our sandwiches. He's like, no, do you guys know that the price of tomatoes went up? We're like, oh, um, okay. He's like, so I got to charge you if I put tomatoes on your sandwich. I'm like, well then charge me the extra 10 cents and just put the tomatoes on my sandwich, dude. Like, yeah, am I working for you here? Like what is happening? It was like the weirdest experience I've ever had in any sort of restaurant ever, but every Quiznos was different. You know, there wasn't a culture across the brands and I used to go there all the time different stores every, you know, around the country. I'd go to different Quiznos and often you'd have that awesome, you know, culture and vibe of, hey, we're a hip sandwich shop. We've got great food. Come on in. We will take care of you. And that guy, he went out of business real fast. Um, but and, you know, and then the franchise system, unfortunately, didn't do awesome. Right. They don't have a subway story. But um, I'll never forget the culture differences as, as I went around the country. They're all totally different. And the franchise owners were the ones that were defining the culture at each location. There wasn't a consistent experience across the board. So uh, yeah, I hundred percent agree with what you were saying about that. Where else and do you, you when what you will find and what you will find with the Quiznos stories is they didn't have good relationships with their franchisees to begin with to build a culture. I mean, they, they didn't even get that far mm -hmm. uh, because they you know they had a lot of they didn't really put their franchisees first. They and, and the franchisees, that's what they felt. And that's that's a sad story, but that's kind of how it went because they had a lot of other stuff. So like you said, they had a lot of quality. They had really good branding and they had marketing. They had so many things figured out, but they didn't start with the relationships and the, you know, and build that, that, that culture uh, from the yeah. bottom up. Yeah. yeah. Or from the top down, actually, because, yeah. you know, Absolutely. It's, it's got to come, the vision for it, I feel like, has to come from somewhere, right? Like, sure. When we talk about the franchise model and all the merits of it, this is an area where you and I, we've discussed this, but we'll talk about more today. There, there's, a, there's, been a, there's a vacuum in some cases of, of true leadership when it comes to culture. And, and I, and I want to, and this is, that was a great example of how that manifests itself in the market. And nobody wants that. Quiznos didn't want no. that. Uh, no. guaranteed. It's not like that a bunch of morons running the show there. They were bright people and talented people running the program there. So, uh, but they, they, they took their eye off the ball in this thing. And, uh, and I think there it's, it's, it was a symptom of a couple of other challenges, but, um, you might know more about that, sure. than I do. but let's talk about this for a second. Cause you mentioned core values when we were, when we were talking about this earlier, uh, to, why do they matter? Like this feels like it's frou-frou soft stuff, right? A lot of people are like, well, yeah. we're core values. Why do core values matter to an organization and especially a franchise system? Well, I mean, it's kind of the glue that holds everything else together. It's kind of the thing you run things through to see if they're going to be a fit for you. Honestly, between your, your value and your focuses, those, those things define who you are as a company. How are you going to grow and be consistent if you can't have those things defined, written down, and run through? How are you going to have, how are, how are your goals going to align? How is everything with your franchisees going to align if you don't share those values? Honestly, you know, you're trying to build, you know, we talked about relationships a lot already. How are you going to um, have a relationship with somebody who your basic values do not align? And you already like, you know, in the same way you already have a culture, you also, you know, you have values. It really is just, it's that important that you need to say, this is what we are. This is who we're looking for. This is how, you know, I mean, it, it, it's just really, really important to me that a company knows what they are, defines them, and then thinks about them consistently. And that the employees know what their values are and their vendors know what their values are and then your franchisees know what they are i mean you know we just talked about quiznos most examples you'll find of organizations that kind of fall apart they didn't define their values because they were just out there to do you know whatever they need, thought they needed to do to, to run their business not knowing some of these these lofty things that I, I understand seem almost kind of cheesy on a certain level. They're not at all. I mean, that's, that's definitely the glue that holds stuff together. And I do believe, you know, that if you haven't discussed that with your management team and kind of figure out what those are, you're really going to fall behind. It's just kind of how I believe in it. I typically wouldn't do this, but if I, I bet you, if we, if we Google searched it, we could probably find 
that Quiznos did have defined core values. I, I would guess they did. You know, they're a big corporation. Sure. So somebody thought about it at some point in the boardroom. They're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Write it on the wall. Let's go. We got other things to worry about. Uh, and I'm, I'm, it's like I'm being mean. I'm not trying to be mean here, but you know, like I think there are a lot of organizations that have defined core values. But what's the difference between like what have you seen and how have you helped uh, growing franchise systems not just define the core values, but let the core values define them? Yes. So that, that's a good question, and that's exactly that's where it comes down to the the people that said, "Oh, we have core values." They didn't really help us. Well, that's probably because they didn't implement them, and they mean so. You know, when you're smaller and you're growing, and you have a handful of people that are running a company, and then you're growing it. You guys, as a group, need to sit down and say, "This is our values, and we're going to live by them, and we all agree on them." So then, yeah. as you bring people in, and it could be more people into the management team, franchisees, vendors even, do they fit your core values? If not, they should probably not be part of the system. When people are evaluating franchisees, typically they, they're looking, do they have enough money? Do they have business acumen? Do they know my industry? I'm sorry, wrong way around. Do they fit our core values? Number one, hire, fire, promote, bring in, get rid of, everybody based on your core values all that other stuff will come come after that if you prioritize core values then you'll get them back out and you'll find all those other things tend to be secondary i can train somebody how to do something they don't know how to do or i can find somebody else that might fit my values and know how to do them just as well and it's kind of all you know are you all rolling the same direction do you have the same goals do you have the same vision those all feed into your core core values. And I believe those are what makes an organization, you know, grow and be able to scale. I mean, franchising is all about scaling. You can't scale if everybody in the organizations thinks you should operate different ways or that thing, different things are important. And I mean, you can test it. Go ask five random people in your organization what your values are. If they all say different things, then you know you didn't do a good job. I mean, that's basically real easy to do. How many of your franchisees know what your values are? Yeah. And there's, there's companies that, that have done a great job on this and they're just, you know, um, I, I recommend people look at like how Dutch Brothers has grown. I mean, they're, they grow so fast that they only let people open a franchise if they've worked there for at least a year and they live and breathe their culture and their core values. And, and you know, that's just one example. But that's, you know, and, you know, I'm not going to go good, bad, good, bad through each organization, but sure. it, it, the, it plays out that I, what, what I'm saying isn't just, you know, hyperbole. It actually is definitely, uh, it functions that way. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. These, these are great insights. You know, I, I, we had a, a this, this topic came up as like just a, a passing thought on a podcast I recorded previously with uh, Jed Morley from... Uh, um, he's, he's a branding expert, but one of the things he talked about was a brand promise. Mm -hmm. And, and this is a concept I hadn't really thought about before, but every brand has a promise that they're making subconsciously to their, to their, sure. their clients, to their prospects, franchisors, there's a brand promise that they're making to their franchisees now. Uh, and it's not necessarily what we do, but how we do it, uh, that people need instructions about. Right, like if you're at McDonald's, yeah, I put the fries in, I cut the bag, put the fries in, drop it in, push the red button, and I wait for the alarm to go off before I pull it out. Right, like they know what to do, but how they do it is actually what takes what 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 perpetuates a good bad culture. Right, at least that's that's my opinion of how you how you break this down at a functional level, and the the brand statements or the value the core values are what I think tell people how am I supposed to do stuff. Like, sure, I've got sure. people on my team that could onboard a new client, but are these going to be like, all right, we got to do two training sessions. Let's get this over with. Or are they going to say, hey, I want to understand you and your business. Here's my cell phone. Like I've got it. My role is just to make sure you guys succeed wildly. Let, let's figure it out. Completely different approaches. They can be governed by and give employees guidance by giving them core values. And, and then that, that becomes the brand promise. And people start yeah. to expect that. And when you break that brand promise, it's like it's like the betrayal of the customer and or the franchisee. You know, you as a franchise or promise, like, hey, we are we are customer centric. We do everything we can to help our sure. customers have a great experience. And then you call the, the franchisor for help, and they're like, 
I don't have time for you. We are so busy right now planning for the annual conference. Figure it out. Call Bob over in Kentucky. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Like the brand promise is broken and it, then that create it perpetuates. At least that's that's something that he talked about, Jed talked about that I when he talked about, I was like, I see that all the time. And I hadn't broken it down that way before is the what do we do, sure. the how do we do, and the why do we do it. Absolutely. And and sometimes you gotta tell a story and sometimes you have to explain you know, what things would look, look like in a specific situation. And then you got to just carry that forward. So, yeah. you know, I, I work one of my old bosses I worked for when I had a boss a long, long time ago, I was, and I'm still friends with this guy. I, I worked for him and it was a pizza company, but he, he'd, uh, you know, he, he basically said, Hey, don't call me whenever you have to take, you know, give something free away to a customer or give, you know, five pizzas away, call me when you can't take where you can't make the customer happy. That's when I want to hear from you. I don't want to hear from you that, you know, you know, we had to go through a bunch of product or this or that. Like, I only want to hear when a customer's not happy. That's it. Mm -hmm. All I want to do is take care of that customer. So that's kind of, you know, and that's, that culture bleeds down into that single unit there at a franchiser level. Yeah, it is a little tougher, but it can be done. It can be done, and it, but it can't be done with the wrong people. So it can, you know, you have to have the right people because none of this is, you know, if you, you know, when you're evaluating a potential franchisee, that's where this starts. I mean, if you have a list of your your values and what's important to you, um, handy when you're evaluating a potential franchisee and you're on the phone with them, or hopefully eventually once this pandemic's over face to face, it would be really, you know, you really need to get to the bottom of how their thinking is like what they're what they're you know what what they would do in a certain situation that has to do with customer service if that's your priority like how would you handle this situation or mm -hmm. so you know those kinds of things i mean it's it's a good idea to that that's first beyond all the other underpinnings that you need to be to have a good franchisee i mean i say cast a wide net and let very few people in and only people in that align with those, with your, you know, that will align with your values. Yeah, that's really smart. One thing that we do talked about before that I want to, I want to focus the discussion around is, is who needs to align with the core values. So let's say you establish the core values, you communicate the core values. Who, who are the critical people in this, this franchise ecosystem that also need to, need to get what those are and align with them as they, as they work in it. You've got I mean, the franchise over in the franchise. Everybody. The employees, for sure. And it's, you know, I mean, and, and it's not, I mean, as part of the training the franchisee, you're going to train your franchisee to make sure they hire people that align with the core values as well. Mm -hmm. Again, you know, they're not just posters on the wall um, when you do that, because then they're going to, if they do that, they're going to understand too, that in order for the culture of their company to be what it needs to be, they're gonna to have to think about it for the people they surround themselves with. And then the vendors. I mean, yeah. you know, people think that vendors are just whatever, they're just there to, you know, you give them some money and they bring you whatever you need. But, you know, if a vendor has, you know, 30 clients and, and whatever's on their truck, if you're a restaurant and it's a food truck and, you know, they have to go over a pass to get to you that's full of snow, and you're the one needing the food to stay open. I hope they'd come to me first. And if your culture is aligned and you treat them well, you're going to find that those people are going to treat you well. And, you know, for whatever reasons, but they're going to think about how they're treated and they're going to think about how your employees treated them. They're, everybody's communicating with each other. And so it's, mm -hmm. it's got to be everybody, you know, the customer's got to feel it. The customer's got to know it. If, if you ask your customers you know what you thought our values are hopefully they would come at least close you know that's yeah. kind of yeah. yeah and that's an interesting insight that's a challenge anybody listening to this i'd, I'd ask you and i'm going to do it uh tomorrow i'm going to reach out to three of three or four of my employees and just say what would you say our core values are and and see what i get um and just make sure i mean because it's a good test of alignment what a, what a good litmus test and it's free and easy uh, to right. do that I, I love what you said about vendors because Ultimately, especially depending on the industry you're in, the vendors are a part of the solution that you're packaging as part of your, your franchise system. I mean, I know we, we get invited to discovery days and we help provide right. training or, or, you know, it's kind of fun of virtual discovery days. You can broaden 
your 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 yeah. who you're bringing in. Yeah, yeah. Because there's no yeah. way I would fly around the country to go to like individual discovery days. I would love to. There's just no way I could do it. But with virtual, I'm like, sure, I'll block off one hour today and I'll sit in and give people some training and show them how this tech stack helps them succeed in your business model. And and I love it. And uh, but if I don't align with their core values and I'm doing that. I'm selling a different vision than than what the franchise promise, their brand promise is. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, sorry, it's a tangent, but I just found it really insightful that you talked about how vendors even need to be a part of this or, um, you know, a disease as or as the employees at the disease are hiring, like, you know, corporate staff. I mean, founders, executives, like I've, I've worked in places where everybody was on the same page except for the CEO. Uh, and, sure. Yeah. And, it would, it, and it, what happened was, because he was breaking the brand promise, it created a complete divide in the staff. And like people started to become a little dispassionate and then despondent and then talent yeah. started to depart. And then what happened to the culture? Like it was just, it was a mess. Sure. So uh, sure. Like a bad apple, just the same way if a bad apple spoils the bunch kind of deal. Like mm -hmm. I've had companies that they just had this one person that they just didn't want to get rid of because they didn't want to fire anybody. And you know, they did a good job and they you know, they, they got their work done in time and so forth. And once they got rid of them, it was like a new day. You know, there was just every, it was a breath of, of, you know, fresh air. And it was just uh, everybody just worked a lot better. Like they, they were bringing everybody else down. It just wasn't about their work. It wasn't just about their work. Because yep. if you have somebody who's showing up late all the time or is not motivated, then that gives the excuse of everybody else. So like, why am I doing it? This person's not fitting into this company a certain way. Why, you know, why am I working to, you know, to do the things I need to do to, yeah. to, to align and yeah, same thing's true with the values and the, and, and, and living through the, doing the things that you need to do to be part of that company, yeah. whatever so, company you're part of. I, I love, I love where this is going. You, one of the things that uh, it makes me think of is a, most people aren't in a situation where like, yeah, I'm a brand new franchise or I have zero locations except for my corporate owned location. Mm -hmm. I'm starting with a clean slate. Like no one's going to be in that situation hardly at all that listens to this. Maybe a couple. Sure. So let's talk about the established franchisors that sure. might might look at their organization and say, you know what? We're 50% on, on point with our with our with what our brand promise should be, with which our, our core values and our and our culture needs to be. How does somebody like that start to start to like reboot? And that, that's and and share some examples if you don't mind. I'd love to hear some input from you on this. Well, yeah. So first of all, I mean, obviously, if you have existing, and that's that's the problem why you got to bring in the right ones, right? Because this does make a difficult a difficult issue with a franchisee because you can't fire a franchisee that you have a franchise agreement, right? Mm -hmm. That that right. may renew, and even if it renews, you don't want them, uh, you know, you don't want to lose any, regardless. So, first of all, you got to figure out, you know. Have you defined them very well and do your franchisees obviously understand them? And obviously, if you could start just by doing the stuff we talked about, by communicating with them when you're visiting them, you know, because a lot of times you're going in there, you're just visiting them and you're asking if they've cleaned the bathrooms and you know, you're doing all this normal stuff. Right, right. Actually have a talk about the core values and ask if they agree with them, if they align with them and if why not. I mean, sometimes it's just about a open, honest conversation. These things are secondary because you've been treating them as secondary stuff. And just because you say it's an important in the email, it's not going to cut it or a message or whatever. Like all of a sudden we care about core values. No, like the CEO, has to have a conversation with the franchisee, especially the ones that they feel aren't, aren't fitting those in. And they got to ask them if they agree with these values, and if they can live up to these values, and if they can start doing the stuff that we talked about, hiring and firing people that fit in there below them, and if they'll align. Mm -hmm. And to be quite honest, if they can't, eventually, they may have to, you know, you might see about buying their franchises out or finding a new owner to take over because the ones that do align may want to grow and take over their companies because it will be poison. You can't say you have these core values and then have 50% 50, 50 of the owners saying, nah, that's not my thing. You can't do that. You're going to, you're going to end up the way of Quiznos. I really believe that. So, and it doesn't mean to not give them a chance and not to give, give them a chance to realign. Maybe they're, you know, they can have a manager 
maybe they can take a back seat and have managers run it that way. But I, I do think it's that important. Um, and, yeah. you know, and, and it, sometimes it's just explaining why it's important too. Um, you know, there's plenty of other things that they can read and find out of why these kinds of things are important. And they, they just need to know that this is, that they're part of a company that cares about the culture and, and that, that they're going to have to have the values to match. Mm -hmm. And, and um, how often have you have seen have you seen uh, Zors that are rebooting these systems that actually point toward the performance and say yes what this is doing to performance at yes at absolutely yeah yeah yes. I haven't seen that done well because I, I you got to be tactful but you know because everybody knows a lot of the folks that are kind of have the cancerous attitudes they're not the top performers very rarely no, are the top third yeah. right they're usually like middle to bottom third performers. You know, they complain and they don't they moan about stuff and they're just in the, the business because they want an income or whatever the case may be right but um how have you seen that done well where the franchisor actually uses um outcomes and results as a way to help communicate the impact and the why behind the core values and the culture well honestly a lot of what they will do is they will literally Compile data. I mean, data is very important. Data is huge when it's coming to you know the results and how they affect it. And they can, you can find trends of you know you can segregate locations that have had bad reviews, for example, and how that's affected sales over time. And sometimes presenting that to a franchisee will motivate them. However, you know a, a lot of <laughs> It's, you know, for, depending on how long a franchise has been around and how established it is, to me, it has a lot to do with how quick they can move and make these adjustments because a lot of franchisees that have just been, you know, franchise organizations that have been around for, for 40 plus years and haven't changed anything and had these long time franchisees that have been around for as long. They're just like, whatever worked yesterday is going to work for tomorrow and I don't care. And a lot of these franchisors in that that just throw up their hands and go well we're just gonna we're just gonna deal with it i, I don't agree with that but that's typically what happens because they're almost at the mercy of their franchisees mm -hmm. uh, at that point um but you know that's you know it, it, there's a there's really a tipping point right there's a tipping point if mm -hmm. you're like you you'd said you know maybe 50 percent how do you change and, and steer that ship the right way you know i believe that's that's a, a good possible ability. But if you're, if you have, if you have 300 units and you've been around and most of them are old school franchisees, that's going to be tough. I mean, that's going to be tough. I, I know franchisors that are just saying, man, I'm going to start a new franchising company and do it right this time. <laughs> Seriously. And that's scary thought, but it's true. They're yeah. like, we've figured it out. And, you know, we've built this, this horrible thing where we didn't have all these things lined up we just had a good product and we were first to market and we had all these other advantages that helped us out but now that it's very competitive i mean you know everything gets more and more competitive through time as people figure out new technologies and new ways of doing things and they know how to run their business and they know they need these things in place it's kind of it's kind of hard in the franchise industry to wipe the chalkboard clean and then start over again with the existing with the existing franchises i mean it's yeah. just, it's tough. I, I mean, there's not always, there's not always the right perfect answer that's going to solve this problem on larger, more established franchises if they're past a certain level. You yeah. can clean it up at your franchise or level pretty easy, but cleaning it up at 300 franchisees location, like, boy, that's tough. You know, that's tough. You have to do it yeah. one at a time, you know, literally one at a time. Yeah. And, and that's, that's kind of, I, I would say that's the only advice we could probably share is, I don't know if you've ever read, I think it's called The Best Damn Ship in the Navy. Um, I was at a conference once and the guy, he's the captain. He was about to, he was about to be decommissioned. He was about to leave uh, the, the, the Navy. I don't know if that's the right word or not. I'm obviously not a Navy guy, but uh, it was his last, last tour of duty. And they assigned him to the worst. He was, a, he was a sterling, sterling record, fantastic leader and commander. And they put him in, in charge of the worst ship in the Navy. And they're like, your last command is to turn the ship around. And so he did. It became the best performing ship in the Navy. They have all these metrics that they keep track of. And, and I mean, in structure, the Navy functions very much like a franchise system. You know, it's interesting. Like right. they, yeah, but anyway, 
they have all of these metrics that come and evaluate ship performance uh, in the same ways that a lot of franchise systems do audits and things. And then they, and they have scorecards and he ended up going from the bottom to the top during his tour of duty. But uh, the interesting thing is that this, is you kind of, it, it started with the tiny, tiny, tiny things. Uh, it started with making your bed, making your bed. That was like one of the yeah. things I remember. It's like, you just gotta, you gotta give them an early whim. So you want to make a culture shift at, at, at scale. It starts at an individual level. Everybody has to get it. You have to be consistent. You have to expect it'll take a long time. And then you start with making your bed every day. And he's like, it's funny because that started to give people the inertia, the emotional energy to say, okay, I can do the next thing. But it was, he started, but he kept it small. And before long, like yeah. he had people consistently doing all the things they needed to do. And they were happier and they were accomplishing more. They were, it became less drudgery. But I think with the franchisees that have been kind of stuck in their ways for a long time, you can't do anything other than maybe facilitate buyouts, right? And that's not a bad yeah. idea. If you, have a, if you have a bad apple in a franchise system, they do a lot of damage with validations, culture, events, anything you try to yeah. do, they're like, nah, nah. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's they're dragging down the company more with just the bad culture. I mean, yeah. You, you, yeah. And, and a lot of franchisors will buy them out one at a time as well starting from the bottom up so they don't lose any and then repackage them and resell them and kind of, you know, put their own uh, company people in there, lift the, lift the metrics back up and then, okay, now it's worth some money. We'll sell it off to a new franchisee that's going to buy into the way we're doing things now. Yeah. I mean, you know, a lot of it does have to do with just, you know, another thing that makes a, a franchisee uh, a good franchisee is that they're really good at, accepting change in technology. I mean, bad franchisors moves real slowly and um, bad franchise systems. And, you know, during the, the time of COVID, we're seeing that where franchise organizations don't move quickly enough to react the best way possible. And some are, but it's always these old school franchisees that are just, they're stubborn. Like if there's a new technology, like technology is the savior of a lot of franchise organizations with the Zoom meetings or the, the hands-free delivery or the contactless delivery or the mobile app ordering, all that kind of stuff. And you got these uh, old franchisees that are like, man, I don't even want to touch a computer or whatever, I could care less about that stuff. And so it is it is also just the ability to, to understand and, and work with the new things that the franchise or comes up with to help you, you know, do what you need to do to be the most profitable and most competitive, right? Mm -hmm. Because like I said, they've been around doing the same thing for so long, they don't see any reason to change it. Like, you know, my least favorite saying of all time is if it's not broken, don't fix it. I can't stand that saying. It fits in like three things, but not in franchising. It's You can always do better because your competition's doing better and you're like, yeah, it's, it's working for me. So why would I even care to improve it? I just can't stand it. You always got to, you always got to take advantage of the, the new things coming out. Yeah. Sorry, right. tan tangent there, but yeah, good, good, it's very good, frustrating good. to me. <laughs> all right. That's all right. You can be real here. Um, <laughs> so uh, I, I want to I kind of shift our focus back to kind of the original intent, right? Yeah. Of what we were talking about, it, which is the whole reason we're talking about culture, right? Is because the culture of the system, uh, and the way and the franchisor to franchisee relationship and the, the franchisee's ability to execute on the how and the why, not just the what, that, that creates a culture that helps you attract and retain and even find right the, the right franchisees to help the system to really scale. Um, well, sure. Yeah. And, and so let's, let's talk about that for a second. Like now that let's let's say we've got this this established culture right that's based on core values and people are buying in and whether it's 100 percent or not people are actually really trying right to, to keep the culture a core part of their business how, how does that help you to find the next right franchisee well first of all people that are bought into your culture and doing well they're going to open additional units which i know is not exactly what you asked but that's going to find your next franchise unit for sure. So yep. as a franchisor that wants to grow, having that culture, I mean, it, it, I mean, people definitely love to come to work when their culture is aligned and the values are aligned and yeah. everything's on the same page. But people also align, I mean, potential franchisees will, will start aligning. You attract the things that you're doing. You know, the law of attraction isn't some 
spiritual thing necessarily. It, it works in action. If you like people that are upbeat and happy and exciting, and you go into a franchise, uh, a, a bit, a bit, a place of business, and you're like, "Wow, this is this is about all me. This is I love this place. I come back here twice a week just because I like the way the people are smiling and 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 doing this." And I, I went to another one; they're exactly the same. What what kind of secret thing that they got going on that I'm not aware of? I want to be part of this because yeah. that's what you potential franchisees are. They want to be part of this, and it's not all about being part of some product you're you're selling. It is part of the way your business operates and acts. And, mm -hmm. and they're like, wow, this looks like a lot of fun. You know, I want to, this is what I want to do, you yeah. know? And it, you know, it, it, so it, it does attract that. I mean, they will, franchises will sell themselves. I mean, if you write franchises for sale on the bottom of your cups and then people are walking in and everybody's just like in a horrible mood and, and don't make, don't make eye contact with you and your experience is horrible that's all garbage but you know <laughs> that along with like like some environment that you couldn't imagine building yourself but you align with and then that's something you know that that's something all of a sudden you know there's a there's an x amount of dollars that franchise that, that they'll tell you how much in marketing you need to sell a franchise and i always tell my clients says like but that's variable right like if yeah. you have a, if you have this this thing that other people want to be part of that they couldn't see them doing themselves and culture could definitely be a part of that. It's going to be less, all right. If it's just, if, if it's just like you're doing exactly what everybody else is doing, then it's going to be more. So, yeah. you know, yeah, we're that, doing less. The number right? will change, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and what yeah. and where I, where I see the hard impact because uh, I I work with tons of franchise brokers and boutique firms and internal yeah. franchise yeah. teams. Where I where I hear uh, from from dozens and dozens and dozens of them is that that the site the validations the validation calls, they, they make, they, they mean everything, right? Or the yeah. even site, the impromptu site visits. If you're doing a, a restaurant type uh, concept, any type, and they're like, well, I've got one of those right around the corner. Let me just check out what it's like. I mean, this is where culture can, it can help or hurt the sales process. And you want to attract right. the right person uh, and you've got the wrong culture out in the field, then uh, you, you could you could really hold yourself because now the only people that are going to come and look at your concept are not the people that align with your vision and your your, your core values it's the people like yeah i want to make a buck i can make a buck doing this and sure sure you want them too you want good business people but but if you want success and and you want to have this culture of people buying multi-units i mean uh had a yeah. good conversation on, on one of these podcasts about that the performance of multi-unit owners versus single unit owners I mean, you tell me, how, how do they tend to perform the multi-unit owners versus the single side owners? They always do better. Not always, but nine times out of 10, they do better. Um, they, they get smarter. Um, the one thing about being a franchisor is you're, you know, things, the things franchisors don't know when they're getting into it is they turn less into like, I'm going to show you how I built this thing and you're going to, I mean, or this business, you know, this is, this is what we sell, you know, about this. It's actually, you're actually business consultant in a way you're showing, this is how you run a business and the, you know, multiple unit franchisees, they, they can pick up on that. In other words, they know how, they know how they're, they're better marketers, they're better operators they know how to run way better labor they know how to they know how to negotiate deals they know how to evaluate the performance of their general managers and so they tend to do they do if they pick it up and they do it right they tend to do a better job just because they're better business people they know how to set goals mm -hmm. you know the the thing about single unit franchisees is they can get internalized in their business they get in there they go to work they just do what they need to do nine to five and then they come back out. Right. And that's, you know, that's okay, but that's not a, that's not a businessman type of work. That's just, I'm going in there to do the functions of that business. And I make a few bucks, you know, entrepreneurs, business people, they're, they step outside of their business and look at it from the outside in and see, okay, this is where I could do this better, or that better. Like you're counting, you know, how many steps it's taking you to walk from here to there. And is there a way I can, you know, get that down to save a dollar here and a dollar there. And then you're, you're really thinking about how your business operates, not about being in there every second of every day to make sure everything is done perfectly. So, you know, yeah. that's, that's kind of, um, you know, so yeah, multi-unit operators tend to do better and, and they tend to want to grow. And I, 
I think that should be the goal of every franchise or to do that. And they're easier to build a culture with. I mean, if you think about having a hundred units and you have a hundred different franchisees trying to maintain culture with a hundred different people with their own personalities, that is going to be tougher than if you have, you know, a hundred units with 20 franchisees open five each. I mean, it's true. It's a truth to say that you could definitely do a lot better with less franchisees Mm -hmm. the same amount of units <laughs> right yeah, that's yeah. always the goal <laughs> and, and you know there's a group i, I would say exponential expo they, they do such a good job of this like they their yeah. goal is is not to have somebody come in and buy a single franchise they do i mean they have the benefit of having cross brands that they can sell but they, they want mm -hmm. everybody to own three to five units sure. uh, as they come in but so I mean, their culture is, is is awesome they've got a great culture they believe it from the top down they communicate about it they're they are about it they don't just talk about it and right. uh, they, they maintain really strong relationships. And I can't say it's universal, right? But I, my feed, the feedback I've heard is they do a great job ma maintaining these super strong relationships with their franchise owners, uh, which, which also helps strengthen the ability for corporate to communicate down and then help them and make sure they infuse the value, core values of the, of the system into their business. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's really good. And you, you mentioned something, and I know we're, we're going to be running out of time here in a minute, so I want to cover this because you, you shared some great insights here I want to talk about. How do you maintain, as a franchisor, strong relationships with your franchisees? Uh, you talked about some, field, some things when you're doing field visits and, and evals and stuff like that. Would you mind dumping some knowledge on us there, Jason? Sure, sure. So, number one, um, I do think words matter. So... You know, historically, the words that people use when franchisors would vi visit franchisees, for example, are called audits. They call them audits, filled audits. Don't use that word, number one. Nobody wants to be audited three times a year. And, you know, you know, when you have the number to your franchise or, you know, support line, it should be franchise support. Your manual should be called support. It shouldn't be headquarters, whatever. It should be, you know, you should be and you should be putting franchisees first. I really believe that that's what they should feel like. They should care. They should think that you care about their success. Number one, that will build that relationship because, you know, we talked about getting the right people in through the values and through the culture. Now we need to nurture that relationship so we can have their ear. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the thing. They, when they think of you, they should be thinking of somebody who cares about their success and is going to work to do whatever they can to be more successful. So, Mm -hmm. more nuts and bolts where the rubber hits the road you're you're the franchise or going to visit for franchisee mm -hmm. what happens in organizations that could be bad is they'll immediately see something wrong right maybe the trash wasn't taken out or the mm -hmm. parking lot looks like crap or the bathroom's not clean first thing the franchisee gets is that's dirty horrible 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 don't do that the first thing you should say to the franchisee if they're there or the manager is what is it we can do to help make you more successful or do, or what are we doing? That, what, what are something we can do better than we have been to help you out? We're here to help you. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's number one, always first priority. Every conversation you have when you're there or even on the phone, what could we be doing better? Let them know that you care about what they think and what their needs are. You need to listen. It doesn't mean you can fix everything, but they'll know if every conversation starts like that, that you do care right yeah. and you and just the fact that you're doing there to be an out evaluate evaluating them why not let them evaluate you every once in a while where you send them a, an evaluation to where uh -huh. they can evaluate how you are as a franchise or even if it's negative you'll see where you could do a better job the same yeah. way they can so you're holding yourself up to the same standards you know that's and, awesome that's awesome but that is terrifying jason most people don't want to find out that they suck or that they're right. doing a bad job but, but honestly, I mean, I'm a weirdo, but I kind of like it. Like if a customer's like, Hey, by the way, oh, you, you did a terrible. How can you ever get better? How could you ever get better? If you never think you have anything wrong, franchisors are not immune to doing stuff wrong. They're totally not. And trust asking people just, and, and I mean, these are not customers that just have a cheeseburger. These are franchisees. So these are people you're building relationships. If they know that you actually care about what they think, that's going to matter a lot. In fact, if I sent that out and they didn't answer me, I'd call them and say, hey, did you get that? We really want to know how yeah. we're doing or how we could do better. We want to know. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's it's really that simple. If you're there as just somebody to like, you know, 
dump your fist on there. Like, this is bad. That's bad. If, um, I think I already told you before, you know, the way that I look about this is if your franchisees do not want you coming there to their location because they're afraid you're going to find something wrong, they don't get it and you don't get it, right? You have yeah. found the best practices and the best way of doing things to make them the most profitable or that's what you should be doing. Mm -hmm. They should be excited that you're there to go help them do the better job and make their business better and make them more profitable because that is what you're there for. And if they realize that and you know that, that shouldn't be that hard. But again, yeah. you know, you're going to talk to them about the dirty bathroom. You're going to talk to them about that stuff, but it's not going to be the first thing you talk about or the last thing you talk about, right? It's going to be in there, but, yep. you know, put a smile on their face before you do that. So it's not, you know, you're not, the, you know, you got to start that conversation off real good and real yeah. positive. So, um, no. and, and that's, that's just one instance, but that's one thing that they do wrong. I know franchisors, a lot of franchisees do not like it when their franchisors show up. They're just like, oh, here they come again with their clipboard and they're writing me down and they're auditing me. You know, that's, I mean, seriously. I mean, how it's such a simple idea and yet it's done wrong more than it's done right. Yeah, and, and I think it's one of those things, Jason, where even just changing the word, right? It'd be so simple to say, oh, I got that nugget. We're going to change it and we're not going to call it a field audit. We're going to call it a field evaluation. Well, that doesn't actually change anything if you show up and still do an audit, right? If you come with right, you know, right. looking for things that are wrong, but if you come at kind of uh, servant leadership, right? You come with the 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 the, um, the core value of I, I my job as the franchisor is to make my franchisees successful. How do I make you successful? Uh, well, it's I, even go ahead. even how you phrase even how you phrase it. The things that are wrong is important because you're not going to not say that. But instead of saying you did this wrong, this wrong, this wrong, you're going to explain like how the companies that did this right and this right and this right made more money. And we know you want to make more money and we know you want to open more units eventually. And these are the kinds of things that we think would help you out. You know, it's not about, you know, your score is 84%, therefore you suck. It's not, that's not what it is. Mm -hmm. It's not. Yeah. 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 What what good advice, man. Well, it's it's time for us to wrap up. But Jason, any parting hey. advice for people that are trying to trying to take a better you know take control of their culture or make a cultural shift so they can attract the right types of franchisees into their system or retain them? Anything else you'd share along those lines? Well, just make sure they're the right values. I literally lock you and anybody in your management team in an office for at least an hour and ask and really evaluate each single person in there to see if their values can align with that. Make sure that there are the right people to be part of the management team because it all comes from that and then, and then it filters down. But if somebody at that top level is not buying in, that's gonna feed down to one part of your company and you're gonna be fighting it the whole time. They, they either gotta agree or, or agree to leave almost. It's almost that important to me, so. Yeah, well, because the impact is so universal. That's great. Great advice. Great advice. Jason, thanks so much for your time. I really Thank appreciate you, you uh, stepping away from Fran Metrics for a second so you could uh, mm -hmm. steal some of your experience and brain power. Ah, I loved it. Uh, fun to be part of it. And um, yeah.